Hi boys and girls, Miss Kathy here from Shaler North Hills Library, and we have another episode of Superheroes of Steam. Dun, da, da, dun. And today's story is about a boy, the boy who harnessed the wind. And it's not something that took place hundreds of years ago, like some of our superheroes of steam are. This is in modern day. The boy is still alive and older than when this book is written about, but he's still a young man growing up today. And he had very little to work with, but used what he did have to do a lot. And it all started with a book. So let's read about The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind by William Kupkwamba and Brian Milar. Pictures by Elizabeth Zunin. In a small village in Malawi, that's in Africa, people had no money for lights. Nightfall came quickly and hurried poor farmers to bed, but for William, the darkness was best for dreaming. He dreamed of building things and taking them apart, like the trucks with bottle cap wheels parked under his bed, and pieces of radios that he'd crack open and wonder, if I can hear the music, then where is the band? His grandpa's tales of magic also whispered in the pitch black of his room. Which planes passed through the window? While ghost dancers twirled around the room as if a hundred men were inside their bodies. At dawn in the fields, William scanned the maze rows for magical beings, then wondered as a truck rumbled past, how does its engine make it go? Pay attention where you throw that hoe, his father shouted. You'll cut off your foot. For all its power over dancers and flying things, magic could not bring the rain. Without water, the sun rose angry each morning and scorched the fields, turning the maize into dust. Without food, Malai began to starve. Soon, William's father gathered the children and said, From now on, we eat only one meal per day. Make it last. In the evenings, they sat around the lantern and ate their handful, watching hungry people pass like spirits along the roads. Imagine if you only had one meal a day, day after day. Money also disappeared with the rain. Papani, his father said, I am sorry, you will have to drop out of school. Now William stood on the road and watched the lucky students pass, alone with the monster in his belly and the lump in his throat. For weeks he sulked under the mango tree, until he remembered the library down the road, a gift from the Americans. He found science books filled with brilliant pictures. With his English dictionary close by, William put together how engines moved those big trucks and how radios pulled their music from the sky. But the greatest picture of all was a machine taller than the tallest tree with blades like a fan. A giant pinwheel? Something to catch magic? Slowly he built the sentence Windmills can produce electricity and pump water. Imagine, he doesn't even speak the language, and he's figuring out what these books mean. He closed his eyes and saw a windmill outside his home, pulling electricity from the breeze and bringing light to the dark valley.
he saw the machine drawing cool water from the ground, sending the gushing, sending it gushing through the thirsty fields, turning the maize tall and green, even when farmers' prayers for rain went unanswered. This windmill was more than a machine. It was a weapon to fight hunger. Magetsi a mepo, he whispered. I will build electric wind. In the junkyard, pieces appeared like rusted treasures in the tall grass. A tractor fan, some pipe, and bearings and bolts that required every muscle to remove. Tonga, he'd shout to the birds and spiders, holding up his prize. But as William dragged his medals home, people called out, This boy is Masala. Only crazy people play with trash. After many weeks, William arranged his pieces in the dirt. A broken bicycle, rusted bottle caps, and plastic pipe, even a small generator that powered a headlight on a bike. For three days, he bolted, banged, and tinkered, while chickens squawked and dogs barked and neighbors shook their heads, saying, What's Masala doing now? His cousin, Jeffrey, and best friend, Gilbert, soon appeared. Molly Lungi, they greeted. Can we help with electric wind? Grab your pongas and follow me, he said, and took them into the forest. Together they swung their sharp blades into the trunks of blue gum trees, then hammered them together to make the tower. Standing atop, William shouted, Bring it up, while the boys tugged and heaved. A crowd gathered below and gazed at this straight machine that now leaned and wobbled like a clumsy giraffe. Some giggled, others teased, but William waited for the wind. Wow, that's quite an impressive thing for them to build, isn't it? It's up pretty high. Like always, it came. First a breeze, then a gusting gale. The towers swayed and the blades spun round. You can see the bicycle wheel. Is what he used to make it spin. With sore hands, once slowed by hunger and darkness, William connected wires to a small bulb, which flickered at first, then surged as bright as the sun. Tonga, he shouted, I have made electric wind. Watch a tabuino, a man yelled. Well done. As the doubters clapped and cheered, William knew he had just begun. Light could not fill empty bellies, but another windmill could soak the dry ground, creating food where once there was none. Magetsi a mepfo, electric wind, can feed my country, William thought. Okay, now everybody thinks pretty highly of him. And that was the strongest magic of all. Now there are many windmills spread out around the country. That's the end of the story, but there are pages of explanation, and there is a picture in the back of him really standing on his windmill. I'm going to put this book down for a minute. I'm going to read the rest of it, but I'm going to move this a little bit further back here first. And read this. William Kabkwamba was born in 1987 and grew up near the village of Wimba, located in central Malawi. Like many people in Malawi and the rest of sub-Saharan Africa, William's father, Triwell, was a farmer. The Kongwabas grew a kind of white sweet corn called maize, which they ate for every meal in the form of porridge called sima. 
but spelled N-S-I-M-A, so the N is not pronounced. To make extra money for clothes, medicine, and other essentials, they also raised tobacco to sell in the capital city, La Langua. Because their only food came from the ground, any problems with the weather or changes in the price of seeds or fertilizers could cause serious problems. That's exactly what happened in 2001 and 2002. A severe drought killed most of the maize fields in Malawi, including those of William's father. Within several months, the entire country had run out of food and began to starve, a terrible event known as a famine. Eating only one meal per day, William, his parents, and six sisters began losing weight. At one point, his father even went temporarily blind from hunger. The famine killed over 10,000 people in Malawi, including many in Wimba. With no food to pay for school fees, high school in Malawi was not free like in America, William had to drop out. But instead of sulking around, he began visiting a library that was started by the American government. There, he found books on science, which he loved. William didn't speak good English, so he used dictionaries to learn the words describing the pictures that so intrigued him. One of the pictures was a windmill. The words said that windmills could produce electricity and pump water. Like most people in Malawi, William's parents had no electricity, and water could be used to feed his father's fields. Never again would they have to depend on the rain. I will build a windmill, William thought. The pieces William used to build his mid-mill were a tractor fan, shock absorber, and the frame of a broken bicycle missing a wheel. For blades, he melted plastic pipe over a fire and flattened them, then carved their shape with a saw. For a generator, that means to get energy to start it, he used a dynamo, which is a tiny bottle-shaped device that produces electricity by turning magnets inside a coil of wire, something called electromagnetism. When the wind blew, the blades acted like pedals and spun the tire, which turned the coils inside the dynamo and produced a current. A wire from the dynamo reached down to William's room and powered a small light bulb. He was 14 years old. Now, I can't make heads or tails of that reading through it, and I'm an adult, and he was only 14, didn't even speak English very well, and he was able to figure that out. Eventually, William used his windmill to charge a car battery, allowing him to power four light bulbs in his parents' house. But his dream of pumping water wasn't achieved until several years later when he built his green machine, which pulled water from a small well near his home and fed his mother's garden, allowing her to grow vegetables year-round. In 2007, William was discovered by some journalists and invited to speak at the TED conference in Tanzania. He'd never been in an airplane or even seen the Internet. Many people were moved by his story and donated money to help send him back to school and eventually install a solar-powered water pump that irrigated his father's fields, forever protecting them from hunger. William is now a student at Dartmouth College in Hanover, New Hampshire. He is studying to be an engineer and plans to return to Malawi to work on renewable energy for electricity and pumping water in villages. And when this picture up on the windmill was taken, it was 2007, it says. This book was written in 2012, and he was a student at Dartmouth at that time, it says. But if you printed out this packet of papers that goes along with our book today, we have the original TED Talk conference video website that you can watch him when he appeared in 2007, like it said in the book. But then there's also an updated video 10 years later from 2017. 
and that one showed him talking about his experience at Dartmouth being over and what he is doing now helping his country. There's a lot of other good sites on here too. Let's go through this packet and see. But before we do that, I just wanted to point out a couple of things here. There were some other words from another language used in this book. And I thought maybe they would explain what those words meant, but they, I guess, tried to explain them with the words of the book. The only thing is I wasn't sure how to pronounce them. So I'm not sure I got those all right. In fact, I'm pretty sure I didn't get them all right, but that is okay. We're doing the best we can here. It says on the back cover about him, he was born in 1987, and he has been a speaker at conferences and universities throughout the United States and abroad. His work is supported by the Moving Windmills Project, a nonprofit group that supports Milan run rural economic development and education projects. So if you would like to look at his cause, that's another site you could check out, movingwindmills.org. On this sheet, there was a word search that you could print out, The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind, and some of the words from the book to look for. Some of them were not mentioned in the book either, and they are just words that tie in with the story. But that is one word search. There was a vocabulary quiz if some of the words you're not familiar with. It shows you what the book means. He was working in his garden with the hoe to scorch is when something becomes completely dried out and they're showing the scorched land there. Sulking, sometimes we all sulk when we're kind of upset about something. Mangoes are a juicy fruit. A pinwheel is one of those toys like you might have used that spins around. To gush is to come out quickly. Bearings, a machine part in which another part turns or slides. To tinker is to try to repair or improve something. And a gale is a very strong wind. So you can learn some other vocabulary words there. There is a crossword puzzle. They call it a crisscross, but the words are given at the bottom and the clues are there and you fill in the blanks. That's one you can do together. And then I talk about the videos you can watch. There's some experiments that we're gonna do together now and then there's some information about Africa, just in general, which is the continent that Malawi is on. And then there's some information about Malawi specifically, which is the country that William was from. And gives you some pictures and shows where in the whole continent of Africa, Malawi is located. It is a landlocked country, it says. That means there are land all around it, not up against the water. Okay, well, we are going to move on to the experiment part of this since he was famous for getting electricity from the wind. We're going to do some electricity experiments here. Not quite as fancy as his, but we will try to see what we can do here. So we're going to move this down so that you can actually see what we're doing on the table. And the first one we're going to do is using some salt and pepper. And again, I did not try these out first so that you can see sometimes an experiment works right away, sometimes it doesn't. And you just have to keep trying. So we are going to separate salt and pepper. We are going to take a teaspoon of salt. So I'm going to measure that out. And you know what, let's 
use a bigger sheet of paper here. You can spread it out a little bit more than a teaspoon of salt. Pouring the salt into my teaspoon measure and I'm going to dump it onto this black paper so you can see it show up really well. And then I'm going to do something very similar with the pepper. it in with the salt. So now we have both of those things. And we are going to spread them out, mix them up together here. You can see that on the tray. And then it says we are going to rub a plastic spoon on a dish rag for about 10 seconds and then hold the rounded end of the spoon up to the salt and pepper and see if we can get the mixture separated. Okay, so I have my dish rag here. I'm gonna try to get static electricity. You guys have had static electricity when you walk into a room and you touch the light switch or something and you get a spark and then you get shocked we say oh you shocked me and that can happen because of the way the electricity is in the air and on the surfaces okay let's see what happens here we've rubbed it on our thing and now we are taking the spoon down to our look at that we have pieces of probably the pepper that is jumping up to the spoon. We turn over our spoon and it is covered with black pepper. So the pepper might be the lighter of the two and it is picking that up out of the salt. So if we do it some more, it only lasts a little bit. So that may be part of why you have to do it multiple times. You can see it coming up. You can see them reaching out, trying to get to that spoon. And there we have it covered with the black specks of pepper again. Not so much the salt seems to be more the pepper that's coming off, coming up. And if you rub it a little bit longer, it seems like it might do a little bit better. Of course, we have our sleeping Susie behind us here. As you can see, she is the color of salt and pepper. It's fun when you do it because you can actually hear them as they click onto the plastic spoon. have to be very close over top of it because they can't travel too far. And again, it doesn't last too long. But you see that we have something that has no movement to it by itself leaping up and attaching to the spoon. And when we're all done, we'll talk a little bit about... I thought I had a sheet here that explained, oh, I do, why these things are happening with these experiments. Let's do one other one here now using a tissue paper butterfly. And I did this ahead of time. I have a sheet of cardboard, just plain cardboard, and I cut out a tissue paper butterfly. You just want it to be smaller than your cardboard. That's the only requirement. It can be any color, any shape wings, and then you cut out a piece of construction paper to be the middle part of the butterfly, the body, and you lay that 
found. It's supposed to be to reach onto the cardboard so that it's not just on the tissue paper that's actually touching the cardboard as well, like that. Okay, then we are going to rub a balloon in my hair to give it an electric charge and hold it on top of the butterfly and see what happens. So, I figure I did not do anything great with my hair this morning knowing that I was going to be doing this experiment. So we are rubbing this balloon around on my hair and then we're going to put it down on top of the butterfly close not touching it and see if we can control the wings okay let's see oh look at that have to hold the butterfly down the wings are fluttering around so they are drawn to the balloon. Let them flutter in the breeze. Even though I'm not touching them at all. And if it starts to fade, you're not getting as much of a flutter as you would like. Then you can always do it another time. You have to be very close. Seems like almost touching it. that almost touching mm -hmm. okay so if we do it again oh my my hair is very very staticky now if you do it again you can experiment with getting it to flutter even more or if you can get both wings fluttering at the same time why does it do that when we rub the balloon on our hair, electrons were lost from our hair. They went from my hair to the balloon, giving it a static charge. When the negatively charged balloon gets close to the positively charged tissue paper, they are attracted, the negative and the positive, want to even each other out and reach out for each other. And the pull of the attraction is so great that the lightweight tissue paper moves toward the balloon okay so that's what we have going on when we have static electricity we have negative and positive forces coming together so we had forces on our plastic spoon we that was like the balloon we rubbed it on the dish towel and we lost electrons from the dish towel that went on to the spoon. And then when you held that down to the salt and pepper, the negative particles from there were attracted to the positive ones on the spoon. And they were rising up to the spoon. So those are two experiments about electricity that I'm sure William could explain a lot better than I did even. And that he would have a lot more creative experiments to do. There are a lot of other electricity experiments out there. I gave you some sites to go to if you want to do something that's a little bit more advanced. These were just two simple ones that I could do with things readily on hand. And hopefully you're able to do some of these activities. Do the word search and the crossword puzzle. If you want to go back here now, we can take a look at the crossword puzzle and do that a little bit together here. Three across, the organizer of a business venture. And again, you have these words to choose from here. So we have three across. These numbers are very small. So three across is this big one here. If you start a whole new business venture, then we say you are an entrepreneur very long word on your list. The stories of William Kumguaba's family were passed down from one blank to the next. When one group of people tells it and they tell the younger 
people and those younger people tell their younger offspring when they have children, that's called a generation. And that is number six across, which is this one here. A temporary shortage of rainfall. We have a temporary shortage of rainfall that is known as a drought situation. And that one's over here. Drought is not enough rain. A structure that creates energy through rotating wind sails or blades. Well, we know that one, huh? That's what William built, a windmill. And that would be on that line there. And the next one is the systematic killing of a particular group of people. We did not talk about that in the book, but that's called genocide. And unfortunately, that happens sometimes across the world when one group of people have so much hatred for another group, not that any good reason for it, and they want to kill everybody of that certain other group. Very, very sad. We need to work for peace and keep those things from happening. One down. Someone who is punished or blamed for an actions of another. And that one, that word wasn't really in the book either. That is a scapegoat. You can be the scapegoat of a prank or something if you get blamed for it, even though you didn't have anything to do with it. A severe shortage of food that leads to widespread starvation, that is a famine that's coming down here. When you don't have enough food to eat, not just you, but like spread out over a whole country. Very sad situation. A form of charged energy that can be harnessed to power machines and create light and heat. That's going to be four down. That is going to be electricity. Form of a charged energy. Four down. Right, right there. Yeah. Electricity is energy. Five down. Immaculately clean. Pristine. That would be something is very very clean hopefully your room is pristine I don't know that your parents would say that though huh and lastly someone who designs and develops a new machine method or innovation that is what he let me see what the word choice is someone who comes up with a new idea is an inventor an inventor new idea. An entrepreneur is someone who may have his invention and then markets it and makes it into a business. And that's what the first word cross was. So you can do all those activities, do some fun experiments, do the word search, and explore wonderful books like this one, The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind, and learn all the wonderful things you can from books. Remember, it all started with him going to his free library down the street. So come check us out at Shaler North Hills Library. We are open to the public. Check our website for the hours. And we are happy to still serve you if you don't feel safe coming in at curbside pickup. This has been Miss Kathy from Shaler North Hills Library. And Seuss is there too, signing off. And we'll see you for the next Superhero of Steam. Thanks for watching.